Um, my name is Carrie Moich, and I'm here with the Yankee Bookshop in support of today's event. Uh, we have books for sale over there with my husband. Um, and as with all of our events at the library, a portion of the proceeds comes directly back to the library, um, just to help out with future events like this one. Uh, we'd like to thank the Norman Williams Public Library for hosting today's event in their beautiful mezzanine. And we would also like to thank the Woodstock Community Television for recording today's talk. You will be able to find this event along with many others that they have recorded for us here at the library on their website and their YouTube channel. Today's author is a very special guest visiting from New York State, Sheila Curran, Bri Bur ah. Curran Bernard. Mm is an associate professor at the University of Albany, a state university of New York school, where she teaches documentary studies, public history, and US history, as well as being the director of the school's graduate program in public history. She is probably best known for her work as an Emmy and Peabody Award winning filmmaker for her contributions to numerous films and series, including the acclaimed theatrical documentary, Slavery by Another Name, for a decade, she worked on the Eyes on the Prize and other documentaries with Henry Hampton's production company, Blackside. And she has also published several books about making documentaries. Today, we welcome her to talk about her latest publication, Bring Judgment Day, Reclaiming Lead Belly's Truths from Jim Crow's Lies. This book takes on the untold story of an American musical legend and is a powerful case study of crime, punishment, and the systemic racism of Jim Crow America. Please join me in welcoming Sheila Curran Bernard. Okay, thank you, Isis. Thank you all so much. And thank you. I appreciate you coming in, as, as she said, coming in on such a gorgeous day. And I want to reiterate her thanks to the library, to the Yankee Bookstore, and also to my sister, Liza Bernard, for making this, this visit and last night at the Norwich um, Bookstore possible. And it gave me a great opportunity to come see this. this Vermont is so beautiful. You people live in heaven. I mean, Albany's pretty. Don't tell them I said that, but it's not Vermont. Um, so what I'd like to do is just start by reading a passage. It's about seven minutes long. Um, for those of you not familiar with the book, it's, it's not really a book about music. It's really a book about um, looking at the narrative, what the world knows about Lead Belly. Oh, for the most part. Um, comes from a 1936 biography uh, that was part of a book about Lead Belly and his songs that was written by a man named John Lomax, who was a quite well-known white folklorist. Um, he was in his mid-60s at the time. He, re he recorded a lot of music around the country for the U.S. Library of Congress. And he and his son, Alan, who was 19 at the time, Alan Lomax, who became a renowned folklorist in his own right, met Hoodie Ledbetter in 1933 when they were doing a tour of the South in search of what they called authentic Negro folk songs, which they deemed that be, they would find the, in most purest form in Southern prisons, which were, um, uh, I can't think of the word, there were, there, were, um, there were more black people in the prisons than there were in the general population. They were, you know, it was a source of labor and that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. Um, but so they wrote this book that was published in 1936 about Lead Belly and about his early years, his life before they, he met the Lomaxes. He was born in 1889 on the Louisiana-Texas border right by Caddo Lake. Um, and he had been in prison before he met the Lomaxes. They wrote this book and they claimed that about 60 pages of it was autobiographical, told in Lead Belly's own vernacular is the word they used. Um, and that became, because people thought it was the, an autobiography, it was used, it's been used by John Lomax's biographer, uh, Nolan Porterfield. It was used by Alan Lomax's biographer, um, John Swed, and it was also used in the only existing biography of Lead Belly by um, Kip Larnell and Charles Wolfe. Um, and so what I began to do, I, in working on Slavery by Another Name, I had done some early research on Lead Belly and also had read this biography and had no reason to question it. But in working on this film about, called Slavery by Another Name about various forms of forced labor in the South in the years after Reconstruction, there were ways that they were using crime and punishment to get cheap black labor back into the workforce. And um, one of the charges, you know, they would come up with these charges that never seemed to apply to white people. They only applied to young, healthy black people. And one of them you know, was vagrancy 
but one of them was carrying a pistol. And that was the charge that had gotten Lead Belly in trouble in the first, the first time. I remembered that from this earlier research. And I began to wonder, what could I find out? What was the truth of what happened to Lead Belly? And he ended up, to me, becoming a real case study of how crime and punishment work. So the fact that he's Lead Belly is sort of an in because so many people have heard of him. In fact, this book is doing better in the UK because he's even more known there, I think, because of his role in the Skiffle movement. Um, but so that's what led to this, was to see what I could find. And it's actually amazing, thanks to libraries and archives, what you can find. I just have a quick question. Did Lead Belly coin the word woke? He probably, what he did, he's, he's, he's credited as possibly being the first person. He may not be the first first, but yes, when in, he, was, he recorded a song in 1938 or 39 about the Scottsboro Boys. And in the introduction and in the outro of the recording, he says that Alabama's a hard world down there. Best stay woke, keep your eyes open. So he is recorded saying that phrase, and he's gotten some press recently that he used that term woke. I understand it that way. Yeah, that was, it was in response to the, you know, the Scottsboro Boys being falsely accused of, of rape um, and, and all convicted and eventually all, eventually all exonerated. Um, all right, so this is, it's about seven minutes long, and it's from the introduction. Um, what is especially troubling about the Lomax's framing of Hoodie Ledbetter is that by casting one man as the violent center of the narrative, they erased the context of racial terror that marked the economic and political dominance of white Southerners in the decades following the Civil War. It was Ledbetter's personal traits and actions, the Lomaxes argued, and most audiences accepted this as fact, that led to his repeated incarceration. Conversely, it was the Lomax's personal traits and actions, and not any sort of privilege or the exclusion of others, that made them deserving of the opportunities and advancement that they and millions of other white Southerners enjoyed in education, housing, and employment. This erasure can be found in liner notes, articles, books, and websites up to the present day even those intended to celebrate the performer. Quote, unfortunately, Ledbetter had a violent temper and was in and out of prison several times in the course of his life, reports the Bullock Museum in Austin. The website of the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame, into which Ledbetter was inducted in 2008, reads, possessing a legendary quick temper, he was arrested and convicted of murder in Texas in 1917 and sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. Until it was changed in 2019, Ledbetter's biography on the website of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, into which he was inducted in 1988, read, a man possessed with a hot temper and enormous strength, Ledbetter spent his share of time in Southern prisons. It is true that Hoodie Ledbetter spent several years in captivity. He served on a county chain gang in 1915 and was incarcerated in state penitentiaries in Texas, 1918 to 1925, and Louisiana, 1930 to 1934, and in jail at Rikers Island in New York, 1939. Yet without historical context, even those who celebrate Ledbetter's ability to survive his time in these institutions are robbed of an opportunity to understand not only the performer, but also the nation in which he came of age. At the same time, to write a biography of Ledbetter's early life without acknowledging the Lomaxes and their engagement with him, including their writing of Negro folk songs as sung by Leadbelly, would be a mistake. First and foremost, it is the Lomax narrative that has defined Leadbetter for the better part of a century. Exploring the choices that they made as they created a persona for him, and the ease with which their version of him was accepted and augmented by others, often in highly negative ways, is an important part of Bring Judgment Day. Reporters, radio producers, Motion picture executives, academics, and the general public willingly went along with what historian Hazel Carby described as the political project of the Lomaxes, which was to, quote, cast the black male body into the shape of an outlaw. John Lomax intended to recover an unadulterated form of black music and in the process actually invented a particular version of black authenticity. Additionally, there are elements of the Lomax's writings that can be verified and prove useful, including both the description of their travels with Hoodie Ledbetter 
and even some discussion of his early life. Notably, where their book seems most aligned with Ledbetter's past, it's when he talked about music, storytelling, and good times with family and friends. Where it is often demonstrably false is when he's quoted as describing terrible acts of violence, always, quote, against his own people, as the Lomaxes put it, as if to reassure themselves and their white readers. Certainly some of this was Ledbetter himself being selective about what he shared, understanding, as did the Lomaxes, that any reported charge that he had been violent toward white people would end the possibility of a national career. Some of Ledbetter's songs contain elements of autobiography. Some also contain lyrics of violence, notably against women. But to the extent to which they should be trusted as character-based is unclear. Much of his repertoire was drawn and adapted from material that had been performed by others he'd encountered, and the choices of which songs he would perform, which he would record, and which he would release to the public were generally made by white gatekeepers, whether prison officials, the Lomaxes, or northern record producers. Further confusing the narrative, Ledbetter himself liked to share what he called tall tales, as they were known down home. The Lomaxes, too, could be selective and at times deceptive when describing their own actions. John Lomax, in particular, is an unreliable narrator, often presenting himself as being drawn into events rather than orchestrating them, even when evidence shows otherwise. In addition, throughout the time he spent, quote, interpreting, unquote, Leadbetter for the benefit of audiences in the press and in Negro folk songs as sung by Leadbelly, Lomax emphasized his own knowledge and expertise while continually minimizing the achievements, talent, and expertise of Leadbetter. At times, though, he paints such a negative portrait of himself in the book that the results gain credibility. Bring Judgment Day is structured around the relationship of Hoodie Ledbetter and John Lomax, primarily between 1933 and 1935, while also drawing on the historical record of Ledbetter's life from 1989, when he was born, to the mid-1930s, when he and his wife, Martha Promise Ledbetter, by then independent of John Lomax, permanently relocated to New York City. Ultimately, though, this book is Ledbetter's. The Lomaxes, for better and worse, played an important role in bringing his music to new audiences, but it was Ledbetter himself who rose to this opportunity and challenge, as he had so often in the past, and then moved beyond it. As a performer, he was a link between the past and the future, a collector and promoter of America's tremendously diverse musical heritage, and an innovator whose creative drive played a vital role in shaping the foundation not only of modern American culture, but also of world culture. To truly understand that culture, a fresh look at the early history of this important American musician is essential, today more than ever. As political pressure is building to limit and even criminalize efforts to teach evidence-based history of the nation's past, a book that re-examines the life and legacy of Hoodie Ledbetter in the broader context of the United States social, political, and legal systems is especially timely. So thank you. So thank you, Sheila. Thank um, you. My name is Liza Bernard. For those of you who don't, for those of you who don't know, I am the program librarian here, and I'm also her older sister. And I have had the honor and uh, privilege of interviewing many authors over the last three decades. But this is the first one with a sibling, and I promise <laughs> no sibling squabbles. Um, <clears throat> so. <laughs> <laughs> so just to start with um, your, your dedication and acknowledgments both reference librarians, archivists, and others who preserve and make accessible records from the past, quote. And I wanna, I'm really curious of how you found records and how that digging work worked and um, when, you, when you started to find materials that didn't line up with the accepted narrative, uh, how you followed that that trail. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm deeply, I mean, archivists and librarians do amazing, amazing work. Um, and I did a lot of the, the most, most of the bulk of the writing and final research during COVID. And, you know, they were, the Briscoe Center at the University of Texas scanned all of the Lomax's letters for me and sent them to me as PDS, which actually made it easier to work. Um, there was a man named Sean Cullane who had spent years trying to write basically a book about Lead Belly, and unfortunately he passed away too soon, but he had an archive of materials that was really useful. Um, I got very lucky in a lot of ways. I 
there, there's a, an episode in the book where um, Ledbetter's parents managed around 1904 to buy 68 and a half acres of land. They were independent farmers in Texas. Um, and at one point when their son got in trouble and, or was accused of a crime, they met with a law firm, um, a white law firm, father and son, and had to turn over 30 acres of their land. And I wanted to understand what that transaction was like. And I actually went to Google and looked up the kind of lawyers who do land transactions in Texas, in that area, in Marshall, Texas. And I just got very lucky. I, the first guy I called, he was like, well, this is kind of interesting. Tell me what you need to know. And I sent him the, the, the questions. And, um, and he wrote back and he said, basically, you know, I, I said, can you recommend a paralegal? And he said, you're not looking for a paralegal. You're looking for a landman. And frankly, I'm the best one around. And I have a little bit of time. And also, it turns out, I mean, he, so he looked at this record, and I didn't know if he was incredibly conservative. I didn't know what his response would be racially or anything. His, his response, his first thing he said to me was, this looks really fishy, which was, you know, so he, he actually, his office was on one side of a court square. You know, these Texas towns are sort of built around the courthouses in the middle, and then there's a square around it. He walked across this thing and he started pulling up the shucks from the, from the arrest, one of the arrests in 1915 and another one um, later. So that was just, you know, wonderful. Um, Kip Lornell and Charles Wolfe's book had mentioned this woman named Joni Haldeman, who was also somebody I dedicated the book to. She passed away. She was a judge in, in Little DeKalb, Texas. It's a tiny little town. She's a wonderful woman. And she had been, 30 years ago, back in the 1980, late 80s and early 90s, she had started conducting interviews with very elderly people who might have known Lead Belly when he was living in DeKalb under an alias. He moved there around 19, 16, 17, and he was there until he was arrested again in 1918. So I had some amazing oral histories. And, and she trusted me. She had 60 odd, you know, cassette tapes, those old-fashioned cassette tapes. And um, a tornado had come through DeKalb in 1999. It was so bad that the kids in the elementary school next to her house they were in the central hallways of the, of the school. They were elevated, like they were like halfway between the ceiling and the floor, it was that much pressure. But it, it took out all of the transcripts. So um, she trusted me, she handed me this box of cassettes and I got a small grant to have them digitized and donated to the Portal to Texas History. But in it was an interview with a woman who had, and I don't have any reason to doubt her, who had a, a brief relationship with Lead Valley at one point and had a child with him. And, there were people who, who remembered him or their grand, you know, their parents remembered him. So it was this just incredible source. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, one lead, one lead leads to another and then you, know, you just follow the threads, so. Well, uh, one, one story that I recall you're telling uh, was about the, and you're gonna have to do the details about the, the help wanted ads for highway overseers. Oh, yeah, I was really fortunate. The, the Marshall newspaper, um, there's an archive called newspapers.com, and you, it's not cheap. It's $75 for a half a year, but it, it, increasingly what they have is online. There is a free one from the Library of Congress, but it's not anywhere near as extensive. But um, um, when, when Lead Belly was put on a chain gang, as you'll see in the book, it's pretty questionable whether he was just, they needed labor, and he happened to be one of the people that First of all, I think he had an attitude, right? He was a very talented musician. He was very, quite well known in the area. And um, his parents were landowners, you know, a mile from this lake where they had just discovered oil. So anyway, he gets, uh, he gets charged twice with carrying a pistol. And, um, but if you look at, in, in the newspaper, they have, they're always looking, they're trying to build, it's the beginning of the good roads movement. The roads were terrible. But having discovered oil beneath Caddo Lake, which is this massive expanse of water that borders Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. But they found oil there, and the first overwater oil rigs were there. But so once you have extraction, you've got to have roads to get the trucks through and to get, to, so they need people to build these roads. So they need inexpensive labor. So the, the newspapers, the Marshall Messenger and other area newspapers had ads for white guys to supervise and things like that. But then there's just listing after listing of people, of black people, being picked up for riding the train, being picked up for public drunkenness, being picked up for, um, you know, just various seemingly minor infractions. And 
and being sent, they'll work it off on the, on the road crew. It's what they keep saying, they'll work it off. And what they'll do is they, they basically, they, they charge them with a debt which is impossible to pay off. And so you have to work off your debt and, it's, and anything you need, medical expenses, anything like that is taken against the debt. So you're really, it's a new form of slave labor in a lot of ways. That first one was in the <laughs> Excuse me, the first one was 1915, yeah. So convict leasing was recently illegal in Texas. So the state could no longer lease prisoners for profit, which they had been doing, but the state, the state could um, use prisoners, as they still do, for county, you know, for civic efforts, for building bridges, for building, you know, a lot of the buildings in the South are built by convicted labor, convict labor. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that, it's, it's amazing. I learned so much more about the Jim Crow South in specific stories as Sheila related them in the book than I knew from going through public high school, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things that you did in your research is you discovered that the chronology, that the accepted chronology of Hoodie Ledbetter's life was completely, was, was, was wrong. It was wrong. Um, his age was wrong, which meant that when he did things was wrong. H how did that change? His, his story, his legend. Well, the, the portrait that gets painted over and over of the young Hoodie Ledbetter is that he was a 16-year-old, this wild 16-year-old guy. He was, you know, full of himself. He was, I mean, the, it's a little bit, the Lomaxes are pretty leering in some ways, the way they talk about him, and kind of jealous. Like, all the girls are want him, and all the men hate him because he's taking all the women. And, um, but he's 16 years old, he's bragging, he's got a horse, he's got this career. And they have him fathering a kid at 16, and you know, basically, he's the man he always wanted to be, and it didn't work. I mean, that's not true. It's not who he was. The timeline is off. Um, he actually he got married in 1908, and he was born. So he was 19 when he got married, which was not uncommon. That's not that young for that period of time. Um, so there's a big difference. And he did father a couple of kids with somebody, and, and his a high school. I mean, a, a a young woman he had gone through, he'd known since grade school. I mean, I don't know what the story is there, but he stayed married to the woman he was married to, but he did have two kids with this, this other woman, but he was a 21, 20 and 21 year old man. He wasn't a 16 year old hypersexual teen. You know, it just, it isn't quite the story that they're portraying as him. And they have all these stories of him getting into these violent fights over women. And chances are, I mean, that playing at a Suki jump you know, they're pretty wild parties. They could get rough. I'm sure they could get rough, but it's not, that's not, it doesn't necessarily identify him as an unusually, you know, as a person unusually. I don't know if that answered your question. But, but yeah. once, the, yeah. once I, I got the actual dates, um, you know, you could, then you, then you start to start put things in the context. Like, he was supposed to have sort of made his name in the bordellos of Shreveport with Sheriff Tom Hughes. Tom Hughes wasn't even in charge when the bordellos were officially the red light district, you know, just a lot of sort of details like that if you're really being careful. I mean, it wasn't the Lomax's focus, and they also, they didn't have access to that earliest information because they're writing their book in 1935. What's interesting to me is that they didn't look too closely at what happened in 1930, which landed Lead Belly at Angola, at the Louisiana Penitentiary at Angola, which is really much more clear cut questionable that he probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. But they didn't, they didn't look deeply, and nobody looked deeply. And you, know, it's, you could see that in the press today, too. You read an article, and then you read eight versions of the same article, and you think, why didn't anybody just go back and check with the, the source? But they, they don't. They didn't. So speaking of the Lomaxes, can you say a little bit about their backstory and how they ended up doing what they're doing, going around the prisons, collecting songs? Sure. Well, John Lomax was born in 1867, so two years after the end of the Civil War. Um, his family moved from Missouri to Texas, so sort of like Lead Belly's family moved when he was about four to Texas from Louisiana, but about 20 years apart. Um, he was raised with a farming family, but they showed up in Texas with like $3,000. They could buy a house right away. They had land right away. Um, he got, he managed to, um, he had land to sell to get an education. He could go to the University of Texas, which was not open to black people. Um, he went into administration eventually, but his love was, was, he loved the American songbook and cowboys. And for a while he did, he was collecting songs. He published a book in 1910 
um, about cowboy songs that he, he managed to get Teddy Roosevelt to write an introduction to. There's, there is a very good biography of him by Nolan Porterfield. Um, but then, you know, he started to have kids. The politics in Texas with the university got weird. So he became a banker, but then by, by um, the Great Depression hit, his wife died. He had four kids ranging in age from, I think, about 11 to 21 or something like that. And he went into a deep depression, and one of his kids said, well, you know, the thing you loved best was going around lecturing and talking about folk music. So with nothing left to lose, he and his, first his older son and then his son Alan started to do that. So that's how he, so he got back on the road. So in, in some ways, when they met in, in 1933, they were, you know, they were both from Texas. They were both older men. One was 47, one was 68 or 67. They were both looking for a new beginning, and it could have worked out differently, but their, their, their visions of what that beginning would entail was pretty, pretty different. Hmm. Hmm. And um, the, uh, they had a big opportunity in, in 34, and then and, um, when they went to the MLA conference in Philly, and um, the Lomaxes wanted Hoodie Led that, who was usually a, a dapper dresser, right? To to give, he was going to give a concert, right? And go ahead. Tell yeah. That so story. so in, when when Led Belly, when he got out of Angola, and um, in spite of what John Lomax liked people to believe, because it was a great story, John Lomax did not get him freed, and his singing did not get him freed from the second prison. He got released on his own good time, on his own cognizance. So. Um, they had been corresponding because Ledbetter needed a job and Lomax's son at that point could no longer work with him doing the collecting and he still had six or seven states to go. And you know these roads are still really rough. The distance between these prisons is long. They were often camping on the side of the road. The equipment weighed about 350 pounds. Ledbetter, I mean Lomax actually developed remote recording equipment to a lot, to a big extent because Previous folk recording, it was really about transcribing the material for, um, you know, for, as scholarship, but not to be listened to. And he began to re record it to be listened to. So he needed help. And also, you know, Hootie Ledbetter knew this songbook better than anybody, but he also could have the trust of these prisoners in a way, the mostly black prisoners, disproportionate was the word I was looking for, these mostly black prisoners and help them understand what it was that Lomax was looking for. But in the meantime, he also, Lomax set it up that despite the fact that Leadbelly thought he was arriving for a job interview, it was an unpaid job. Lomax was the quote unquote body servant. He, had to, he drove the car, he maintained the car, he was up before Lomax, he got his bath ready, he got his clothes ready, he kept everything clean. He was a servant and, um, and a chauffeur and then he was also in the field providing his expertise, and he would sometimes start the singing to get people, you know, to start competition among the singers and that sort of thing. Um, so in 1934, actually 90 years ago this week, they met up in Marshall when Leadbelly was free and Lomax was home from his honeymoon to a second wife, and they set out to finish the tour for about three months going up the north, the um, east, lower, the mid-coast, basically, um, and then Lomax had this plan that he was going to unveil Leadbelly at the Modern Language Association's annual convention where he had presented before, but this time, in the past, he had sung his own songs. This time, he was going to show up and he really worked the press that he was coming with this genuine Negro convict, basically, is how he would put it. And he used the term Leadbelly, even though Leadbelly himself, that's a prison moniker, and Leadbelly, in all his letters in the year since, he didn't sign his name Leadbelly. He would sign it Hoodie Leadbetter, a.k.a. Leadbelly. Um, and, and Leadbelly, you know, among the oral histories, even when he was, I mean, he was fastidious. He would, when he would go from, um, from job to job playing when he was younger, he would have a blanket on the horse. He would be dressed very spiffy. Even when he was working in the field, his wife would, you know, iron his iron overalls and things like that. He was just very meticulous. And um, there's a photo of him playing just before they arrive at the MLA, and Leadbelly's in a, it's a, it's a hand-me-down, but it's a, a three-piece suit. And John Lomax insisted that he wear a, you know, a, farm, a farm field's hat and overalls. And then he let him, he wasn't paying him, but he let Leadbelly do this shtick where he would pass out the hat and get money from people. 
And Lead Belly hadn't made money in months, so he did the shtick. You know, he just he he, he did it, and um, and that was the beginning of how basically that's how Lead, uh, John Lomax introduced him to the press. And some people, you know, Richard Veit was among those who who challenged it, but a lot of the press just accepted this portrait of, you know, that this this talent, which Lead Belly spent years teaching himself and perfecting, he played many instruments, not just the twelve string guitar. But he was amazing on the twelve string guitar. Um, but he could play piano, he could play accordion, he could, you know, mandolin. He used to play mandolin with Blind Lemon Jefferson. Um, but Lomax presented him as this primitive and as this, you know, untamed beast. And he wouldn't let the press talk to Lead Belly because they might give him airs. And he also didn't want Lead Belly to spend too much time in Harlem. His first night there was either that night or the next night was. The first night it was New Year's Eve, and he ended up at a club where Cal Calloway was playing. And I mean, this is the scene. Lead Belly, you know, he wanted to be part of that scene. He wanted to be Gene Autry. Was he? He really wanted to be a singing cowboy, because he had been a cowboy, and you know, he could sing. He had the hat. But um, Lomax ended up deciding he had to very quickly move Lead Belly out to Wilton, Connecticut, which was 45 minutes to an hour by train. And he, to get him to do it, he, he brought his, he paid for his wife, his girlfriend to come north, and then he arranged a marriage so that um, there would be more press. But yeah, he, he, he did a real disservice to Lead Belly. On the other hand, you know, Lomax did arrange recording, uh, recordings with the American Record Company and things like that. You know, without John Lomax, would we have ever heard of Lead Belly? Who knows? You know, so it's, you know, but it's important to correct the record, I think as well to understand you know, what he did and what he didn't bring to it. Well, they were both building towards a vision, but their vision of, of how to get there was very different. Um, and and, and um, it came apart as their communication really broke down. Can you say a little bit about how that? Yes, it did. I mean, part of it was, in, and I try to make this point in the book, that it's not, I mean, it's not news that John Lomax um, held very racist views. That's, that's not news. What's kind of incredible is how many people didn't question it. Like, the recording companies would go to Lomax, even before Lomax had a contract with Lead Belly, they would go to Lomax to negotiate for Lead Belly services. You know, the, um, the mayor of New York at one point had a party and invited Lead Belly, but he invited Lomax. He invited Lomax to bring his person. You know that kind of thing. It was a weird. And this is this is up north. Um, they did a they did a first they did a radio version of the March of Time, and then they did the second ever film version of the March in Time. And it was really based. It's horrifically racist. You can find it online. And Lead Belly participated, but he, I, I'm sure he hated it afterwards. I know he did. Um, but it was all, it was basically this Lomax's interpretation that made Lomax look good and like he was doing a favor to Lead Belly. And um, yeah, so they were, but it, you know, eventually it, they, they didn't get the hoopla, didn't lead to much in New York City. So Lomax decided to go back to the audience he knew best, which was academia. So they d started to do a tour of colleges in upstate New York. And, and Lead Belly by then had just had it with being treated the way he was being treated because he would try to go into the black communities and the music scenes in cities like Rochester, which had a very vibrant music scene in, in, on Front Street. And, um, and Lomax just you know, tried to, he tried to control him. It's almost like he thought he had paroled Lead Belly to his care, like he was responsible. He got scared of Lead Belly in a weird way. Like, like he felt like, he seems to have felt like if something happened, he would be held responsible, which just wasn't true. There was not that relationship. He did not parole Lead Belly. Um, but Lead Belly, he wanted his own, he, he wanted to start getting paid directly. He didn't want to keep having to turn over, even the hat money had to turn over to Lomax. By then, by then Lomax and his son Alan were taking two thirds of any income and, and Lead Belly got a third. And, he, and Lead Belly was just sick of it. And he wanted to control his own money and he wanted to decide where he could spend his day. And in the middle of that, this March of Time came out in, in <coughs> theaters. And I, I, I'm, it's conjecture, but I have a feeling that some of his friends in Rochester and Buffalo saw this film and he was hearing about it from people and he may have gone himself. And it really is a very embarrassing portrait of him. You know, um, it's just, he's, 
It's just he puts him, it puts him in a very demeaning position, and, Lead Be and Lomax acts as if he's very surprised to see Lead Belly show up in his room asking for a job and pledging to, you know, I'll be your man for your whole life. You never have to pay me a penny, and it's just awful. So, um, so that was, it was pretty much the end of it. They recorded one more session, and by the end of March, uh, Lead Belly went, and Martha left and went back home. And ironically, like the next day, Lomax tried to get another man out of prison, another black man, and he, I don't know, he didn't do much research because the guy was not a performer and couldn't drive. So it's <laughs> like, what's the point? It didn't work out. Um, but yeah, they, he put up with it for about six months, and then he and Martha drove back to New York. Um, I can't remember how, it's like eight months later, and just, he never left. They reestablished themselves. He didn't move up into Harlem. They lived in the, on the Lower East Side for the whole time. And he, he eventually, and I don't go into this in this book, this is what the Kip Larnell and Charles Wolf, their book is good with. He eventually, um, you know, he found a home with the folk music movement and the labor movement. Um, he in, influenced a whole lot of people. His home was an, a gathering place for Josh White and Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie. And he was a mentor to a lot of folks and he played nightclubs, and, but he never made any money. And, um, and then six months, he died in, in December 1949 at the age of 60, he was almost 61. And then five months later, the Pete Seeger and the Weavers record, released Goodnight Irene and nobody had thought folk music was ever gonna make money. And all of a sudden it was clear that there was money to be made in this. And so, you know, actually to Alan's credit, he was among the people who renegotiated some of the copyright issues because L L Lomax had copyrighted all of the music. So it got complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Is it your sense that one of the concerns that John Lomax had was that by being exposed to the music scene in Harlem and Rochester and you know what was happening in those places was considered sort of jazz oriented? Yeah. That would dilute Red Belly's authenticity. Absolutely that was exactly what it was. Uh -huh. And you know the poor guy. I mean, he's driving in a in a car miles and miles, and Lead Belly's doing all the driving, and Lomax is probably puffing on a cigar most of the time. Even if they could find a radio signal, which would be you know it's pretty early days, but there were some you know t around the cities, he wouldn't let him play the radio because it was gonna um, yeah exactly that contaminate him, which was crazy because and that was his theory about these guys in prison too and women in prison, but. You know, the recording industry emerged, you know, after the First World War. So by 1920, 1922, you know, people have records. And these guys were not, hadn't been, you know, they weren't in these prisons for the whole time. You know, people come and go. And it was kind of a flawed argument to begin with. But, yeah, but no, that's exactly why. Oh, also, I'm going to say one second. Also, there was the possibility that somebody else would manage him. So there was that. Every, the oral histories are so the, lovely about that. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, she, she asked how and, how and why did he start to become musical. He was a little kid. I mean, he literally like, you know, sitting in a little rocking chair. Um, he had two uncles. His father came from a very big family. He had a lot of brothers and sisters. I think, I can't remember if it was nine or something. A couple of them were what they called musicianers who would travel around and play. Um, so he, um, I think the first... This is going to bug me. I can't remember the first instrument, but he stayed up all night and basically taught himself by ear. But his girlfriend from the time, who knew him from elementary school said he used to play like when he was six, seven years old, he was playing things. And at one point, he really, really wanted um, a guitar. And so he worked for it. He would like to help his uncle in the field. And, and he, but he could just pick things up, too. But he, I mean, he worked really hard at it. But he was also, I think, innately very talented. But he came from a musical family, he, like he taught, he had a little sister who had, his parents had adopted and he taught her and they would play together and he traveled for a while with his cousin Edmund, they were very close in age so they were kind of like brothers, but Edmund decided to go into the church, he didn't like the, the life, it was just, he, it wasn't for him, but um, yeah, apparently he was quite a prodigy. Yeah. Are there other questions from the audience that was gonna actually open up at this point anyway, so this is good timing. Are, are there recordings of, of um, playing other instruments? I'm only familiar with the Twelve Finger Concord. Um, I, you know, I don't know. 
I mean, the prison ones are only the 12 string guitar. I'm sure there must be. That's a really, I don't, I should know the answer to that and I don't, because I didn't, I didn't, again, I wasn't really approaching this from the music point of view. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and they're just picturing the piano. Just yeah, when he was playing, he could play the piano. He, he definitely was apparently very good at the um, mandolin and also the um, jaw harp. He could play the jaw harp. I can't think of the other ones he played, but yeah, he was. You said mandolin was Josh White? No, um, Blind Lemon. He and Blind Lemon played around, they used to play the trains, they'd ride for free around the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And, um, and he would, Blind Lemon was a little bit younger. People always say Blind Lemon influenced him, but I think it was a mutual thing. But they would play, they would ride the trains, and he sometimes would play the mandolin, and, Bl and Blind Lemon would play guitar, or you know, vice versa, and they'd sing. And you know, Apparently they'd attract a lot of women too, and that was fun too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're re they don't know the lead belly story, but in terms of yeah, they're the the um, Poland Norderfield book is Pol Nolan Porterfield book is really quite good, and it and it that? it recognize well, like interlibrary loan. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah, amazing, it. but it recognizes that you know John Lomax. He really he often writes about things like the invitation to the MLA. He orchestrated it. The evidence is there. But he says, oh, you know, out of the blue, this invitation came along. He, the, the meeting with when he started to pair up with Lead Belly to go touring, he, the world thinks, because of the way he presented it, that he was just sitting there reading a newspaper and this, as he said, timid Negro, you know, tapped him on the shoulder and he's like, what, Lead Belly, what are you doing here? And, you know, what that gained, I mean, it just, and he makes it, Partly it's because as he's writing this, there is criticism, and so he makes it, again, he makes it so he's doing Lead Belly a favor. Right. And, and, and Lead Belly's the one who's so grateful he'll do it, and it's just, yeah. And, and I, I, maybe I'm mistaken, but I thought the Lomax recordings were sponsored by Library of Congress at, at some point. He had so grants. He had grants from the Carnegie Foundation, uh -huh. and he had grants from um, Rockefeller. He had a nominal position at the Library of Congress, but I think they helped him with the machine that, that he used. Yeah. And I mean, the early recordings are there. You have to get permission to listen to them, but I don't think that's that hard. But um, they're in the Library of Congress. And then there's the commercial recordings. But like the commercial recordings, Art Satterley, even in 1935, when the, that blues craze had passed, you know, Ma Rainey's, the Ma Rainey's and, those, and Bessie Smith's, their day had really ebbed. And that's what he wanted to send out from Lead Belly. He had recorded Goodnight Irene. He didn't release it. So, um, and he also, he recorded a couple of cowboy songs, but really didn't pursue those either. Gene Autry, that's great. Yeah. Well, he actually, Lead Belly went out to Hollywood to try a career. He was gonna star in a show called Green Acres, but it, Green, it was a play. It was a really famous play, Green something. But it didn't, whereas the, anyway, he didn't, it didn't work out. And was there, um, you mentioned Richard Wright's um, uh, um, criticism of, of, of Al Powers. Is that, is that in published works? Yeah, it's in The Daily Worker. Uh, Richard Wright wrote for The Daily Worker. Uh, so there was some criticism. And he wasn't the only, there were a few people who said this was an exploitive relationship. And, and John, I mean, you know, Lead Belly and um, the final stop on that northern tour was, was um, John Lomax had gone to Harvard for graduate school for two for a year. He did an MA in a year, so he really wanted, and he had he'd never been an academic, and he really wanted to kind of prove himself to an academic audience, and so it was a very big deal. Even after he had, they had really made it clear they weren't going to continue. Um, they did, they went to Harvard and they had a dinner celebrating Alan and John. They they didn't invite Martha and Hootie to the dinner. You know, it's just. And the way, you know, it's the way the college newspapers talked about a black performer. You know, they loved his music, but the, the racism of, these, of the time, it's just painful. Hmm. Are there other questions from the floor? Your, um, your um, recent uh, documentary is available where? It's on PBS. You can watch it free streaming uh, on PBS. Okay. It's called Slaver by Another Name. 
I mean, the book is also really good, but it's they're different. They have a different narrative structure. It's, uh, the the book is night is 400 pages, and the film. If you take a 90 minute film and write it out as a script, it's 35 pages. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a lot of it was still a lot of research, but it's just it's just a different medium. Okay. Well, if there aren't other questions, I want to close and just say that um, Brig Judgment Day is incredibly well researched and documented, and there are more than 50 pages of notes and sources. <laughs> and sources are really important because one of the things that I learned from reading this and just life and reading the news is how important it is to go back to the primary source to build a foundation on. It's like in the library if we're shelving books and somebody puts the book in the wrong shelf and then we use that as the beginning place, there's no alphabetization right. at ever anywhere. It's just that the foundation doesn't work. And that's true when we learn about history. So it's really important to go back. Um, and well, I, we, were, we were talking about that on the way over. Like historians, male historians, invariably talk about, you know, the old farmer who owned the land. And then they talk about John, Lo I mean, um, Ledbetter's father, you know, that he managed to buy 68 and a half acres of land and he managed to turn 68 and a half acres of land into farmland and stuff. Well, he didn't do that. He and his wife and his family, I mean, sharecropping is not a one-man operation. It's a family operation. And his wife's name is on the legal documents, but they get erased. And it's not just, you know, these, I mean, pretty much any book, any biography you read, the women get erased and erased and erased. And you go back to their letters and stuff, and they're making the decisions. They're part of the voting process. They're, you know, maybe not officially, but it's... Yeah, you, going back to the original sources, it's just unbelievable what you see. And plus, you know, history is interpretive. So it, it is by its nature an interpretive art. That's part of what makes it interesting. So with a different perspective, you interpret the, the, the prison records or the arrest records or the legal records right. or the land records right. always differently, and you could build a different story. And, and somebody else can argue... I mean, I, you know, I called a friend of mine, you know, because it gets overwhelming, and I called a friend of mine who's a historian who's written about women in the convict leasing system, Dr. Talitha LaFloria, and I, you know, I was like, well, I, you know, I don't know, like, I can't, you know, there's so much information, there's so much information, and she said, you know, think of it as a continuing story. You're picking up where other people left off, you're taking it a step farther, other people will, will pick up elements of it and move farther, and you're just adding to the conversation, and that was kind of liberating. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where I read many statistics about the, um, the use of, of, of um, jail labor. Um, at, at maybe, maybe at the Civil Rights Museum in, in Birmingham, I think. But um, it's, it, it's almost surprising that they, they would let them out after a couple of years. Um, I, it, it was such a, such a captive. It was, it was so exploited. Well, there were also, I mean, if you look, sometimes there's financial, right, it's 1933, he's in prison from 1930 to 1934, and if you look, the newspaper accounts are all about budgets, and the, but, the prisons are supposed to be self-sustaining, and at some point, it's economically not feasible to have that many people that you have to house, and also you have reformers coming in and saying you can't treat people this way, and so between that and, you know, usually the dollar is the decision maker, so you do see that happening, that they, they are releasing many, many. And he was seeing this. That's part of He was agitating for his release since he got there in Angola. Plus, he felt like he shouldn't have been there. But, um, but you see them releasing just you know, three or 400 people at a time because they just have to get people off the rolls. Mm -hmm. so. so the Start Kirkish Review... I'm going to just read it as a closing statement because I think it sums this up. It's, quote, the portrait that emerges in Bring Judgment Day is of a man who defined himself as a musician, a song composer, and a dancer, and whose legacy deserves better than the, de the demeaning characterization that's persisted for decades. And it's, it's time that Hoodie Ledbetter got his moment in to shine. So... Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you.